Yes. Great. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Right to Public Access Committee, April 27th. Um, so just first of all, I'm just going to review the agenda. Um, looks like we'll be approving three sets of minutes today since we've forgotten uh, last couple of times. Um, we'll be uh, reviewing Melissa's research that we <clears throat> just mentioned there, um, going through that material and seeing um, you know, what information that gives us on Heron Point Road. Um, <clears throat> Melissa and I did meet with Melissa Lowe from Audubon yesterday, uh, just with some questions regarding the Boathouse and um, Way 100. And uh, we'll discuss appointing members of the committee to certain contacts, just to kind of organize the committee a little bit and um, reduce confusion. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, with Nancy and Jordan, we'll be looking at um, the shellfish landings list um, and just trying to come up with a plan on, on how to move forward with that and you know prioritize or um, I know Melissa before you've, you've mentioned um, doing a joint meeting with the shellfish advisory, you know, that might be something we can discuss. Um, then plan for the next meeting and adjourn. So um, let's start off by the minutes. Do we need to vote to approve each set of minutes or is that just something we can vote on um, once for the three sets? I don't know. I do have a correction on one. I I think it was John that uh, pointed out in uh, the February 25th minutes, uh, item number two, that it's uh, Bruce Herter, not Bill Herter. Yes, yes, that I did correct that. Okay. So the- uh, And I can double check. What was up online though, didn't have that correction. On it. Oh, didn't? Okay, I'll have to. I think, I think we can approve it. Uh, yeah, that's just- That's a... corrected. So, so. And it, you said it was Bruce, what are, I'm just writing down what, what you just mentioned. I had a name confused. Uh, February 25th, uh, yep. second item, very first word is Bill Herter. And I'm pretty sure John, is that, John, is that correct? That Bruce it's, Herter. It's Bruce Herter. Yep. Bruce yeah. Herter, okay. Okay, there so I'll just write that down and I'll make sure that's corrected before I turn them. Okay. Um, so I would make a motion to approve the minutes from 125, 225, and 326, three sets of minutes. Second. And we'll take a vote. How do I initiate that? <laughs> Call our names. Okay. Um, Melissa? Aye. Uh, John? Aye. Steve? Aye. Sonia, aye. Great. Okay, so the minutes are approved. Great, and um, so let's let's move on to all of this fabulous research. <laughs> Melissa, you want to fill us in on, on what you found? Sure. Um, I have yeah. the documents here. I can sh do the the screen share if you like. If if there's anything you want me to kind of reference or. Um, I have I have more um, put together in a clearer way. Okay. Um, so I can share them when I when I look at everything. Um, but I I do want to say it, like it, everything I did was helpful for piecing together the story, but not everything is going to be useful. So I'm not going to go through all of it in the intro. Oh, absolutely. Time. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think I'll start with maybe what might what might be most useful. Um, to securing a landing there, which is what we want to do. Um, so let's see. Um, so I'm sharing. Oops. Okay, so we know that the Aggers have offered to sell us an easement through their property. Um, the problem I saw, the roadblock that I think we had to get over really was whether or not we had access to the beginning half of the dune trail, which in our earlier meeting, we were de deliberating on whether or not Heron Point Road was 
public or private um, because we thought that might be a way to figure out this little piece here because we do also know that the parking situation here is um, allowed with verbal permission at the moment. So what I went into was first looking at the the different ways that we can make it happen. So there's one one way we're using the um, the document for Massachusetts states and ways for severs and um, this document includes a derelict fee statute and again this this is all like my interpretation I'm not a lawyer so we might have to figure this out um, but I, I pulled it because it says that um, the grantor conveying a lot um, the conveyance will include a fee interest of the grantor in the way unless the grantor retains other real estate abutting the way in which case if the retained real estate is on the same side of the way the division line between the conveyed land and retained land extends into the way to the extent the grantor owns the fee or if the retained real estate is on the other side of the way between the division lines extended, the title conveyed shall be to the center line of the way, if the grantor owns so far, or B, the instrument evidences a different intent by an express exception. This statute is retroactive. So my interpretation of this, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but this lot was conveyed in 1964. Melissa, uh, your uh, pointer and your uh... Shared screen don't line up on my screen anyway. Oh, where your is pointer is right between page three and page four. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. I'm like, I don't. All right, I'm that. sorry, guys. This is okay. new to me. Uh, I was listening. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Maybe if I stop screen sharing. And then share this. Okay, thank you, thank you, Steve. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is what I read. This is the derelict fee statute. I thought that was up, but great. Um, so according to this, my interpretation is that the owner of this lot owns to either to the center line, if the person who gave it to or sold it to them. Um, kept land abutting the way on another side of it, or it owns the entire way if the grantor did not in fact own these lands. So we know that the Audubon owns this land right here. And so I think my interpretation would be that to the center line of this way in the cul-de-sac, the Agars may very well own all the way to here, and then the Audubon may own maybe to here, in which case we might have access to this dune trail. I could be wrong. <laughs> um, does that sound clear to everybody? Um, my question was, you know, and it's probably just because I, I am a little confused by the whole ownership. The discrepancy I, I thought we were looking at was Heron Point Road is a road, but it was just that turnaround that was what was confusing, right? That the turnaround was part of the landing that never got registered. So that's what we're trying to figure out, right? Like who legally would own that turnaround? Because that's where the trail is. I, I could be wrong, but my interpretation was that the landing was established on town property that is no longer town property. Right. The landing doesn't exist. We know that this is owned by the Aggers. So the goal in my mind was to reinstate a landing, not because there was a landing there, but just by way of some other way, mm -hmm. um, which would be purchasing the easement from the Aggers and then also securing access here. Right. Um, Melissa, did you determine whether uh, Herring Point uh, uh, Road was uh, private or public? So I'll I'll get into more of that. Okay. That's the second way we can okay. go about this. I think it's very complicated. 
but I think this right here might be a very simple way for us to think about this or to to move forward. Um, okay. So the only complication here is if we do in fact have access um, to this beginning half of the dune trail, then the issue is can we drive to it in order to get to the parking? Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting and I'll have to stop my share. Is that do you guys see two maps? Yeah. Yep. So what's interesting is that the left side is, um, uh, Zoom is still kind of complicated to me. Let me just do this one. Okay, so the left side is from an aerial image from March 2019, and that's Oliver. So this is Oliver overlaying the assessor's database over um, the GIS map from March 2019. The right side is um, the assessor's database overlaying its own layouts, as well as the assessor's survey, which is the black dotted line, and a September 2019 GIS map. And the difference between these two, this is kind of like one of those newspaper <laughs> um, can use about the difference things, is uh, as far as I can see, I, I first thought that the overlay was accurate for both. But then if you look, there's these three points in this lot here. Can you see my cursor? Yep. Um, so two of these points are inside the way. And then here, two of these points are outside of the way. So my interpretation here would be that depending on the overlay, whichever overlay is accurate, we either have access to this parking lot through a road that goes through the Audubon because we do have verbal permission, or we don't if we use the assessor's map, the assessor's database map, because it's shifted. <laughs> so I don't know which to follow, but, but we could we could maybe use a, a surveyor to clarify where that road actually is. Um, mm -hmm. And if it is not on the paper road, then we might have a way by using that derelict fee statute. Um, so let's see. And stop me, Sonia, if I just go too far. Okay. Um, or just, you know, <laughs> get off topic. Um, okay. So I want to share this again. So are we looking at the word document? We've got derelict fee statute in the map. Perfect. Okay, so that's one way we can do this. The other way, as far as I can tell, is to figure out, as Steve said, whether or not the road is public or private. And we know um, but in 1963, it was voted that the town accept the road. Now this is pulled from uh, the town reports. However, in the Massachusetts um, Ways for Surveyors document, which is all about the um, master and law, um, it says that we have to make sure uh, determining whether a way has become public under the, under the first of these three methods, which is layout by a public authority, can require a great deal of circumstantial evidence where direct evidence only establishes the way in question as laid out as a highway under the colonial laws. The courts are unwilling to assume merely that ways are public and require a quantum of proof that such is the case to avoid the consequences attendant to a way being public, such as liability for failure to maintain the expense of maintenance and snow removal, not co coincidentally ready divisibility of land by a and R plans. So my interpretation of that is that it's going to take a lot of extra evidence of what happened here to actually prove that this is public and the burden of proof rests on the person trying to lay it, deem it public. Um, so it says here that only a town meeting may discontinue away. 
upon acceptance by the city council or town meeting, the way becomes a city or town way. It looks like that did happen here. The town accepted the road. However, each step of the process must be followed or the layout or acceptance is invalid. And that steps in the process include Um, submitting, it says, no public way shall be laid out, altered, re relocated, or discontinued unless the proposed action has been referred to the planning board for its report or the passage of 45 days without a report. It also has to have seven days prior to adopting a layout, the selectmen must give notice of their intention to do so to landowners whose land will be taken for such purpose. And then after voting to accept the layout, it is not established until the layout with the boundaries and measurements of the way, if filed with the town clerk, not less than seven days thereafter, is accepted by the town meeting. The town vote to accept a layout requires only a majority vote. But the but. Um, Section 24 of General Law Chapter 82 requires that selectmen adopt an order of taking for the layout within 120 days of the town meeting vote accepting the layout. So there's lots of things that needed to happen in order for this to be a valid legal landing. And they're not all clear to me exactly um, how we go about determining this, but I think um, pursuing the route of figuring out whether or not this way is pri private or public um, is just gonna be very complicated. And um, I do think that the first way is the most efficient way to go about it. And we can we can discuss that, um, but I won't really get into all of the plans and the stories unless you want me to. Um, <clears throat> you mean the, the plans you, or was it the newspaper article you found in the past? There was some conflict with... Um, yeah, um, so... Um, so one of the things that's interesting is um, you have to give a notice of intention to the landowners. And what we don't know is who owned that land. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the story that's still unclear to me. Um, I can get into what I do know if you want me to, or we can just, we can just focus on the, the legality of everything. We had talked about um, uh, getting some questions together for legal counsel and then submitting a request uh, for legal counsel to look at that, um, that as required by the selectmen. We talked about that, I think, two meetings ago, didn't we? We did, and we, we had, I think what we were trying to do is clarify what those questions were first, which is good because now we've gone forward and done some research. And now, I, now I feel like we're moving closer to being ready to having that question yeah. you know like we said now we we know that we what we want to know is um you know whether heron point road is public or private and um whether the is it the derelict fee statute mm -hmm. applies to that that parcel of land so i feel like i'm, I'm glad we've held off because now we're getting a clear picture of, of what that question would be um so i would think at this point we can, you know, there's a lot of documents to look through, and I think we could probably, you know, take some time between this meeting and the next to kind of um, process it all and, you know, get that, those questions together. I mean, it, it seems like it may be a, a couple of questions, right, regarding the boathouse. Um, My basic question is, can we get from Lieutenant Island Road to that, uh, to the boathouse or to the landing? Right. And, uh, whether it's private or public, uh, whether it's on uh, uh, private land or whether it's the Audubon land, we, uh, the basic question is, can we drive to it, park there and walk to the water? To the landing? Great. I think that's the big overlying question. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the simple practical answer is yes. I mean, it's been happening for years. There's no issue about, you know, nobody has complained uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess it's always useful to get it in place legally. So 50 or 100 years from now, you know, if somebody decides to try to block access, but, 
you know, chances are the, the sea level rise will be what blacks access, not the uh, owners of the land. It would be nice to get just a, a reading on it that right. says this is how you can get to that site. And that's basically what this committee's job is to do, is to uh, determine uh, rights of public access. Well, yeah. I, think, I think Bill brings up an interesting point because there are some ways to the water, and we, we can talk about this in um, the item in, on our agenda that's gonna prioritize um, whichever areas we wanna focus on, but there are some areas that I think may be best left untouched. Um, some rebel agreements that maybe we don't wanna, um, Alyssa Lowe had said, shake the can of worms. And, <laughs> and um, I think we, we have to really balance out that, that that question of do we do we need to secure access for the future? Is this potentially going to be a broken agreement, or is this working as it is, and we don't see it becoming broken? Um, I think here, I the fact that there was a landing and the fact that there are grants here, um, I think makes us more <laughs> inclined to make this an official landing. Um, but maybe we can even do it in a way that's not going to call more attention to the site for more foot traffic, vehicle traffic. I think if we do the derelict fee statute way and not make it officially a public road, then this is sort of done quietly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Sounds good. And and you know, and that's another you know, that's advice I would think we can take from a lawyer, right? Like whether to pursue that or not. That you know. Yeah. Maybe there's something about that that wouldn't work, and we wouldn't know, you know. So. Yeah, um, and my my, and I think that's a valid point. I mean, my only thought would be, you know, if it gets to the point that it looks like you're taking somebody's land, then mm -hmm. sometimes people get defensive, even if they don't need to. So right. that's the sort of stirring up the can of worms. I think otherwise people won't even notice, and it will be fine. Right. Well. Um, yeah, this is kind of cutting over to the next item on the agenda, but speaking with Melissa Lowe, it was um, just because this is related, um, it was good to find out that, you know, Audubon supports that public access and, you know, they're, they're willing to, um, you know, maintain the access there and, you know, they would, they would never want to cut it off is basically what, how she was explaining it. Um, so it's good to know that you know, they, they don't have any problem with with the road being used and, and the parking um, being established there as it is. Um, but to Melissa- This is Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hi, can I just add something? I, I'm on my phone, so I can't see and I don't know how to raise my hand on the phone. Okay. Is this an appropriate time? Yep. Um, so, the only thing that I hesitate about is verbal agreements. I think that we should get something in writing, even from the Audubon, just stay, stating like we plan to maintain this access in perpetuity or something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and I don't know, some sort of agreement with the Aggers, um, you know, if there's a different way to go about it with them and community preservation funds for an easement or something, um, and I don't know if you guys have moved beyond that, but I'm just trying to think of some written documentation. For example, you know, there's a verbal agreement over on um, Chipman's and it, you know, it was a landing that was really in somebody's backyard, but it had been used for decades and then the person died and then the house got sold and there's just like no way we can just forge our way in there. So... I think that some sort of written agreement um, or acknowledgement with the town would be important for moving forward, just to protect it in the long term. And that's all I wanted to contribute. Right. Thank you. So what we want to do is is uh, listen to Bill and say, don't make a ruckus, don't can <laughs> don't shake up the can of worms, do it quietly and under the table. But but Nancy wants written proof that we have access to that landing. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, because if that piece of land ever gets sold and there's nothing documenting it, then you really don't have anything when you have a, 
a, a verbal agreement. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, some sort of making it official with some sort of legal document to me would be preferable for the long term. So are we are we looking to establish this spot as a landing? Is that the goal to reestablish that landing that was never um, registered in the 60s? Or are we just looking to guarantee like an easement or access to the spot? Well, I think you can establish a landing with just an easement. Oh, okay. So um, I, I think access is the question, do we want to secure it for mm -hmm. the future and how? Um, to Nancy's, I do, I do see Nancy's point. I, the Irene Payne documentary shows that there are plenty of ways to the water that have been lost over the years. And that's part of the reason why we're here. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think um, there has to be a balance too, because we can lose those ways if we do this in a way that's not, um, not gonna work. <laughs> um, and I would also say that previously Jim Falcone had said that the Audubon was not amenable to any sort of written agreement. Um, I can't elaborate, but that's what I remember him saying. Okay. All right, well. This is, uh, this is John, can I throw in a couple points? Um, first of all, I, I think it's in the long run useful to, to clarify whether this Heron Point Ray is public or private. And I, I think it would be useful, uh, Melissa's work has, has pointed the way with some questions. I, I think we got, we need to get the questions answered. Otherwise, um, this committee, 15 years from now, will be having the same discussion. The second point is Steve mentioned the, the sea level rise. And I think we ought to consider that maybe in this 15 years, um, getting to the pathway via the Audubon is going to be impractical. And what do we do then? And I think if we have the public-private situation clarified, that would that would be a uh, that would provide an answer to that too. So for a couple of reasons, I I I push for formal clarity, which means taking Melissa's good work and getting getting a a, a proper uh, lawyer to stamp it as good, and get whatever documents we need, like easements. To uh, get it all down in legal use. Yeah, yeah. Get it, you know, clarified, put to bed. Documents Monday. filed with the town. So, um, I make a. Uh, can we can we do this as a motion? I mean, should we make a motion that we should put together and have Melissa do it since she knows all the stuff. Uh, something that you can put in front of a lawyer and say, how do we make this uh, documented and legal with the minimum amount of noise? That would, that, that would suit me, but we've, you know, we've got to all agree on this. Okay, well, I'll make it as a motion then. I'll second. Great. Any discussion? I think we've discussed it. Um, I, I would add too, I think, um, I think it's gonna take a really long time um, to get our answer. Um, it might help in the meantime to reach out to the person who is listed on that brochure that Nancy sent out. Um, it, it listed some phone numbers for pro bono legal advice for towns seeking to secure public access, which is what we do. Um, so we might also wanna pursue that. Well, that would be a great first step. I, I don't think my motion specified uh, what lawyer to use, did it? 
Secretary, did you write, write down the motion? Yes. <laughs> I don't think it uh, did. it say town council or I, I, I put amendment. Sorry, what's that? I could amend it so that it could be any legal pro bono or you know, paid town council. Um, 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 amending a uh, motion that's before the floor gets to be another can of worms. Uh, so I am going to propose that we am, uh, amend that motion to uh, not specify or to specify that any legal advice can be used. We just want a legal statement. And now I think we have to vote on that amendment to the uh... we we didn't vote on the first motion no okay. Don, you're not coming through if you're trying to um uh, so I'm, I'm off the edge of what i know about robert's rules of order uh why don't i just retract it all i can i can do that i think without a vote and restate the uh, motion that we seek counsel in order to get uh, legal documents showing that we have access to the uh, boathouse uh, landing. Um, should we elaborate on that question a little bit? Um, just in terms of the public private situation with Heron Point Road, you know, um, I guess what I'm saying is, should we vote on preparing those questions maybe for the next meeting? Is that a, a move we should be making? In other words, instead of going to legal counsel, just prepare the questions for the next meeting. Well, I mean, we don't have the questions in front of us right now. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something we would have to approve at, an, at another meeting? At another <laughs> meeting. Okay. So I can withdraw the whole... Uh, Whole thing, and we can just say that for the next meeting, we will prepare the questions and then we'll vote on. How's that sound, Steve? I I think we have. To, I think the words Heron Point Road have to appear in the motion. Uh, I'm with. I'm withdrawing the motion because it sounds like. Okay. Well, when we have the when we have the next motion, I would I would suggest that. Okay, um, what we're talking about now is putting together a set of questions that we present to legal. Um, That's right. That's, uh, I and, think, and then we'll discuss that at the next meeting. And so what you're That's saying, fine. those questions should talk about Herring Point Road. Specific, there should be a specific reference there, yes, please. Okay. I don't think we have to make any motions or do any votes. We are just going to... Uh, Melissa, will you put something together for our next meeting that would be something you could hand to a lawyer? Sure, I can do that. Um, I wish this could be a collaborative process, but I don't know how to make that happen. Well, yeah, I, I, I think I'm just not sure on, on how, you know, is this something, do we come up with the questions like right now? Is that what happens in the meeting or is this something we work on? I, I guess personally, I'm not really sure how this works. So. Um, yeah, I'll take, the, I'll take the questions now. Sorry, what's that? I'll take the responsibility for finding out how to make it happen once we have the questions. Okay. Okay. I, and I was just saying, I think you guys can collaboratively work at the table now and, and come up with what your questions are. Okay. So, Melissa, the, you mentioned that just said, derelict fee statute is is that part of our question is yeah uh let me share it again you see it yeah okay so so i see two ways this way being using the derelict fee statute um i think the bigger question is how do we secure access so maybe asking the lawyer um does the public have the right to use this dune path here given the derelict fee statute that the Audubon owns to this point and the Agers own to this point? 
and they have both agreed to allow access. And maybe that easement could include the access here, um, easement from the Aggers at least. And then the secondary question would be um, who owns Heron Point Road? Um, I don't know how to phrase that, but there's lots of questions we can ask to figure that out. I think maybe the lawyer might might be the one to ask maybe what the right questions are to ask. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So it seems to me from what uh, some of the stuff that you put together, uh, that, that big document by uh, Sid Smithers, um, that uh, it, it can't be, the Herring Road can't be, uh, Herring Point Road can't be public right now because the town is not maintaining it not plowing it, not doing anything to it. So I think by definition, it's not a public road by the definition of a public road in that document. Does that uh, sound right, Melissa? I would disagree. I think, I think who maintains it is an important piece of evidence in the story, but according to this document, I feel it says that the only way you can discontinue a town way is at town meeting. And if there's somewhere else in there where it said that it legally prevails as a town road until it's discontinued. Um, so I think this, I mean, that is definitely part of the, the circumstantial evidence we're gonna have to collect to maybe present to the lawyer what we know. But um, I do think this is a potentially viable way. My only question would be, has the town actually followed through on the necessary um, things it needs to do after the vote in order to make it valid, these three things. And then also, has it been discontinued? And I have not had time to go through all of the town reports to do that. Hmm. So, I, <laughs> I'm having a hard time here figuring out what we need. Should the question just be how can uh, how can the town of Wellfleet secure access to the boathouse landing? I feel like it needs to be more specific, but I don't have the experience to know. And John, you wanted uh, us to talk about the road specifically. Aaron yeah, all that. Both for the current situation and for the long-term situation. I think that ought to be clarified. So those are two questions for the lawyer. So the questions would would basically be how can we secure access to the boathouse landing? And is Heron Point Road public or private? Or accessible to uh, anyone it doesn't that be called public maybe but I think, I mean, if I look at the, the legal opinion obtained by Helen at the, our last meeting, it was very, it was a very specific question and it referred to, um, I think it, it said something like, does the town have the right to use this road by way of this law and then this law or something else? I, it could be wrong, but I think it has to be more specific to really get what we want. Um, is it possible to get a, is it possible to get an easement from the landowners association if it turns out to not be a public road? I mean again, I guess that's part of what we're what we'd be hiring a lawyer for. Yeah, I think the I mean if I'm the association, I don't think we have any jurisdiction or authority over over ownership of the road. So it would come down to who owns the road and they would be able to give you the easement. Um, my understanding was if it, it if it was laid out in the uh, plan, one of the most recent plan for um, the tennis island that uh, that it basically gives right to all the landowners in that um, plan doesn't give rights to uh, anybody else. So that would be, might be something that the landowners could give to maybe specifically shellfishermen. 
Yeah, I think it's the land. In other words, our interpretation is that each landowner owns the middle of the road in front of their property. So the association, you know, if I live on the second island, I can't be part of giving, you know, land that isn't adjacent to my property. But the individual landowners would could do that. So that means that uh, uh, access might have to be, well, first of all, is any part of the actual road that we use, which doesn't appear to be very close to the paper road, is any part of the actual road that we use on anybody's property other than the uh, Audubon? And I think the answer is no. Uh, but if it is, then we'd have to get easements from uh, the three or four landowners whose uh, edge of their property would drive over. Um, so again, who, who owns the actual road that, that we drive on? I guess it's probably more important than who owns the paper road. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. Can I propose a question for the lawyer? Yep. Um, two questions. The first one may be, does the town have the right to use the this? We can lay it out on a map for them to see too, but the first half of the dune trail, given the derelict fee statute, um, if the owner of this lot, 178, allows it and the owner of this lot allows it. And we can make that better worded, but yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the second question um, would be Is Heron Point Road public given the vote at the 1963 town meeting for the town to accept it? And also given by Dot, 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 any evidence we can find um, for these three things happening that need to happen for it to be official. Now, you sent us a document as well that had Heron Point listed. It was the, um, was it the town parcels? There was a, a yeah. list of all the roads. And I thought that it said on there that Heron Point Road was public. That's right. Um, and that's actually where all the confusion really is, because according to the assessor, it's private. According to DPW, it's private. According to the latest subdivision plan, it's private. Okay. However, this, this town meeting in 1963 happened. And in 2005, the town hired a consulting group to create this document of town owned roads and parcels, which included Heron Point Road. And I can can share that here since we're talking about it. Um, I didn't see a key to what three, two, and one meant on, on that document. I didn't either. It might be in the introduction, but my takeaway from it would be that they were not 100% certain. Um, and then the other fact of it too, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. So this is the map that they show where the, the black, heavy black marker is keyed as town road. I think they lose credibility when they list the boathouse parcel as of town landing in 2005. So I don't know how much credit I really want to give this report. There are evidence for the road is only the town vote, which, um, let's see. Is this it? <laughs> yep, here it is. Uh, here it is. So their only evidence for the road being publicly owned is the town vote, which we know we need further proof. All right, so I, you know, can can we vote? Um, these are our questions roughly, but we can improve on them and then, you know, potentially send them through to the lawyer or John can, 
John, you mentioned you know how to make that happen. How the lawyer um, can be contacted with questions. You there, John? Yes. Yes. So it, it sounds like we we have a rough idea of what the questions are. You know, we can potentially just tidy them up and improve on these questions, and then what's the next step after that? Or if the, if the agreement is to use a council, I, I've offered to be the facilitator for that, make that happen. Great. So um, do we want to vote now on moving forward with these questions? Would that be a motion? Um, I make a motion to uh, go forward with seeking legal counsel um, and using these two questions that we've stated. Um, does the town have the right um, to use the first half of the dune trail if allowed by um, the Audubon and the owners of that lot by the boathouse? Um, obviously we're gonna improve on the question. <laughs> And is Heron Point Road public given the vote from the town to accept it in 1962, was it? Three. Got it. Three. 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 I'll second that. Okay, so um, should we take a vote? Okay, um, John? Aye. Steve? Aye. Melissa? Aye. Sonia, aye. Okay, we all vote in favor. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we'll just prepare. I'm sure we'll clean up the questions a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll we'll have them ready for for John and we can move forward with that. You know, what, one other thought I have is that you might spend an awful lot of time trying to sort out history and maybe you just start from scratch. I mean, if you get permission from all the relevant parties now going forward, you solved your problem. It doesn't matter what the history is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, should we move on? Um, Good idea. Yeah, let's move on uh, to review just some information that we got from Melissa Lowe um, regarding the boathouse and Wade 100. And we got some updates regarding the southwest corner and um, the access um, before the bridge at, at Lieutenant Island um, regarding the ditch that needs to be filled in. Um, so regarding the boathouse, we basically um, described the situation that, you know, the situation that we're in with the boathouse and trying to figure out um, who owns the road. Um, we basically just discussed the fact that the mapping is a little confusing and, um, you know, the road that's in place right now kind of looks like it's in between Audubon property um, and private or public road property. Um, so basically what Melissa Lowe was saying was that um, you know, the, the Audubon doesn't have any problem with the public using that road and accessing the boathouse. Um, and moving forward, she seems to be supportive of, you know, it, if we did prove it to be a landing or that there is access there that the Audubon would, would support in helping with, um, you know, parking and maintaining the area. Um, obviously that you know, the Audubon doesn't really want anyone parking on the marsh and things like that. So they can provide, um, you know, possible uh, ropes and poles or things like that along the edge of the marsh to, to prevent people from parking there um, and just kind of control the current parking situation. But um, 
they didn't really, she didn't really have too much um, information on like the history of the spot or ownership or things like that. Um, Melissa, did you have anything to add there with our discussion? Do you feel like that, that was pretty much what we covered with the boathouse? Um, way 100, we are basically just looking for advice from the Audubon because the Audubon shares that property line along that access road. Um, you know, we described how those, the two lots, um, 153 and 154 off of Way 100, um, that access road out to the flats uh, is in a poor state and there's a mud hole in it. Um, and we described that the, the, road, the access road itself is, is actually on private property, isn't on Audubon land, but it kind of abuts it. So we were just looking to see if Audubon had any interest in giving advice on, you know, deterring people from, from using that road if they don't need to. Um, they seemed hesitant to do so, which, uh, you know, which I understand. I mean, currently Audubon is doing a lot of work around Lieutenant Island. You know, they're helping with the Southwest corner. Um, you know, they're, they're doing repairs on that other access road. So I, I feel like they're kind of hesitant to get involved in any other projects, um, whether it be signage or, or things like that. Um, she also did note that that Audubon does promote access. So they'd be hesitant to deter access to a spot that people are used to using. Um, and they, they would rather see the, the private property owners deal with whatever they wanna do. Um, so that was roughly what we went through with the, with the Way 100 access. Uh, Melissa, did you have anything right. to say anything? Yes. Mostly. I had a couple of I had a couple of questions about Way 100. Yep. First, first of all, did um, Melissa Lowe bring up the the issue of the terrapin nests? She mentioned it, and she mentioned that they have used that road in the past, um, you know, for their research. Um, are, are you are you raising I, that? What I was thinking. I was what what I was thinking particularly is whether Audubon would feel obligated to close access during the terrapin nesting season. Okay, yeah, I mean that that's something I hadn't asked, but it's it's certainly something we we could ask her. And when is the nesting and season? Then, oh. And then the the second point that I think it would be useful to raise is um, even when you get to the south end of Way 100, you still have to cross the salt marsh, um, which is not done with motorized vehicles, it's done with carts. But uh, did, did, you, did the, the issue come up with Melissa Lowe whether that, that, that was acceptable? Um, no, we were, that's what's we're, we were just- That's what's happening now. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we were just asking um, for advice on deterring people from using that, that portion of road. So we didn't really go into, into that subject. Yes, Melissa? Uh, I, I think, so the Audubon has said in the past that their land is open to shell fishing um, and they are very aware of what we do in the marsh. Um, I, I, I know everything that they there's not much that's a written agreement, but I think I would assume that that's okay. Um, All right, good. I think you've said that before, so it's good to be reminded. Yeah, and then the other thing about the terrapins is she mentioned that the, the females will actually nest in that oh, mud pit, and then some cars will run them over, um, which is awful, but yeah. I, I don't think they actually have any way of preventing that from happening because that mud pit is on private property. And then way 100 from Lieutenant Island Road to way 100, that's all a private road. So they actually have no jurisdiction there. And that was one of the reasons right. why they were hesitant to get involved at all. Yeah. Um, and on yeah, top of any okay. financial constraints that they have. They, you know, the way we were discussing it 
or you know obviously we're just bouncing ideas around but like the whole idea of, of trying to kind of reduce that traffic to like you know whatever put up a sign that says shellfishing only or or something to that effect um but you know the way that audubon would see it would be that'd be sort of cherry picking you know who you would want to allow onto that that portion of road that is actually private it's not really even their their jurisdiction yes melissa sorry <laughs> um i think that's a really good point and i think we should think about that too because is it really in our purview to be restricting public access mm -hmm. on a private lot i understand that the shell fishermen use this road and i think we're very appreciative that the landowners let us do that but to restrict the public from using a private lot i don't know if that's really something we should be looking at as a committee right yeah so um so that was the information we gathered there um so we'll have to i think moving forward you know i could send an email to the aggers and to lori just kind of letting me know that the Audubon doesn't really want to get involved there. Um, you know, this could be something we we continue looking into um, in the future. But uh, let's see. And then just a couple more updates. Uh, the access road before the bridge. Um, the the process is underway to repair that. Um, the goal being to have that hole filled by next October, um, which would be the opening of the oyster shellfishing season in that area. Um, she did mention that Audubon is under a bit of a spending freeze right now. So, you know, things may not be moving <laughs> super fast at the moment, but, um, you know, the process is underway and it's just gonna take some time to get all the necessary approvals, um, conservation, various things like that to make that move forward. Um, but it is underway, so, so it was good to get that update. And then lastly, um, the southwest corner, um, same situation, that's all underway, um, you know, establishing parking and uh, setting up ropes and poles along the marsh to prevent people from parking in the marsh. Um, the, that process will also take some time. Um, we're looking probably around August or so. Um, there may be signage posted a little sooner than that, but they have to, um, what was it, a notice of, they have to put together a full notice of intention for the work that they're going to do, which could take some time. So, so anyway, that was the overview of our meeting with Melissa Lowe, and it was good to speak to her and hear her opinions, get some advice. So that was great. Um, and let's see, moving on. Uh, contacts and other committees. We were wondering if, if the members would be interested in, in sort of being assigned certain contacts um, just to kind of organize the committee a bit and, um, you know, keep us from you know, emailing the same people, you know, we didn't, Melissa and I encountered that with Melissa Lowe, you know, we were both asking her questions at the same time. So we wondered if um, the members would be um, interested in, you know, organizing our contacts in some sort of way, um, whether it just be kind of the, the main players we address, you know, shellfish advisory, shellfish department, um, you know, uh, Lieutenant Island, you know, various things like that. Um, is that something that we're in agreement with? <laughs> I think one of the one good. of the important one of the important committees for our um, coordination besides shellfish is um, open space committee. Yeah, because yep. they also deal with land issues. Right. So I have I had like a rough list here of of committees that we we addressed quite a bit, let me just pull it up here. But like, yeah, homeowners, yeah, you know, Bill House, obviously he's here. Uh, homeowners Association, Open Space, um, Shellfish Department, Conservation Commission, Conservation Trust, 
uh, you know, Field Point Homeowners Association. Uh, Mass Audubon. Mass Audubon, obviously, yeah, like we just discussed. So Conservation Committee, right? Did I mention that commission? And maybe, maybe somebody to manage talking to communication with the homeowners as well. If they're actually that's the homeowners association. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. So, is there, you know, any um, anyone want to be responsible for any of those contacts? John, is there anyone you would prefer? You know, say if you could choose two contacts. I, I think I've got like roughly ten here. Um, do you have a preference on? I, on could, I could do the open space committee. Open space committee. And and um, NRAB, which is easy because I'm chair. NRA, yeah, resource <laughs> advisory. <laughs> Maybe there ought to be someone else besides me for that. So not the natural resource advisory, right? Because you're on it. Well, because I'm chair of it, so I'd be I'd be, you know, coordinating with myself, which is easy. <laughs> yes, yeah. Great. Well, I think okay. it might be redundant for one of us to be coordinating with you about our <laughs> issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this doesn't all have to be set in stone either. It's I, I think we're just trying to um, No, but you'd bring it you'd bring a different you'd bring a different point of view, which is important. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so John, you said open space committee. Do you, yes. Do you want to be, so if we assign to, do you want to be in contact with Bill Huss as well? Lieutenant Island? Uh, no, one at a time. Yeah, Melissa and I have a pretty good, so I'd be very happy to work with Melissa. Okay. So Melissa, Lieutenant Island. That'd be great. Uh, let's see. I've been in contact with Barbara Brennesel. Do you want me to continue that conservation committee? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Melissa Lowe. Do you want me to take that as well? Sure. Great. So I'll be Melissa Lowe. How about shellfish advisory? Well, um, Nancy's husband has done work for us. Does that count? <laughs> so uh, I would take uh, selfish advisory. Okay, the only, the only, well, my comment would just be that um, it might be interesting for one of the shell fishermen uh, to be tapped into what's going on at shellfish advisory. Okay, I mean, I yeah. Do you want me to take shellfish advisory too? I don't mind. I'll take either you or Melissa. Um, I think it just, no offense, Steve, I just think like there's so much going on there right now. Um, I feel you know, like I, I, I'm fish out of water here anyway. Ha. Melissa, do you want to be on, do you want to be in contact with the Field Point Homeowners Association as well? Sure. So um, we've got kind of like with the home. Sure. If you don't want shellfish advisory, I can do that one too. Mm -hmm. Great. So I've got you for Field Point, Lieutenant Island, John for Open Space. Um, let's see, Conservation. I got my name under there. Conservation Audubon, Shellfish Advisory. Let's see. I think. Uh, I think that should start us for now. What do you think? Is there anyone, is any there, other groups? Is right the now? work pretty split, Sonia? I'm getting yeah. left out. Oh, wait, Steve, that's a natural resource advisory board. <laughs> okay. I got it. Steve, and let's see. Um, Steve, let's. Yeah, so I basically got Melissa for the for the homeowner, a couple of homeowners associations, John for open space. Uh, let's see, conservation. 
one, two, one, two. Conservation trust I have on the list as well. Is that something someone wants to take yeah, on? I can, I can do that. Yeah, okay, Steve. The, uh, um, Is there anyone else? I could, I could do that quite easily because um, the chairman of the Conservation Trust, Danny O'Connell, always comes to open space meetings. Oh. So that it really, really those meetings are about both what what both groups are doing. Okay. So, John, let's put you for Conservation Trust then. Sure. Okay. So you've got two. Just because it's. Yeah, that makes it's sense. Just because it's easy. Mm -hmm. And Steve, we need to give you one more. <laughs> okay. uh, do you want to take, uh, let's see. Well, we, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be another contact <laughs> that we haven't thought of. Yeah. Is there, am I, is there any that I'm missing there? I think what we should do is put this list together with the yeah, people like that have been assigned. And, um, and we can we can adjust it as necessary. Right, right. I mean, this doesn't have to be sensitive. Great. Okay. Well, that gives us a start anyway. Yep. Um, and let's see. Uh, landings. So I don't think we need to go into this in full detail today, but it's you know the the shellfish landings list. Um, you know, it was updated slightly. I think there was a couple spots that were added. Is that, is that correct, Nancy? There. Yeah. Sorry, say that again, Sonia. So we updated the landings list, right? So there's. Do we yeah. Based more on. Um, yeah. Yep. Based on feedback from, uh, I think it was Barbara Austin at. It might have been at your last one of your last meetings that she came and participated, or it was at Shellfish Advisory when we went over it. But yeah, she did. Yeah. Mention, um, I want to say it was like a Drummer's Cove landing. Yeah, the Water Street. Yeah, there was Cannon Hill Beach where the Cannon two Hill were Beach. added. Yeah, yeah. And then what was the other one that was added? Cannon Hill I think it was Cannon Hill Beach because it's actually a town landing. Okay. And wasn't there one more? Just looking at the list here. I only saw it. Oh, hold on. Wait a minute. I, I have my file right here. Hold on. Two new ones. Cannon Hill, I was aware of, and I'm not sure the name of the other one. Do we have, um, yeah, we have the sand pull out. There was another one on Chiquesset Neck Road, but that one we went and checked out, and it's, it's gone. It's gone. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in terms of, of making a plan moving forward and, and prioritizing this list, um, I think, um, you know, is this something that we should do in collaboration with the Shellfish Advisory? Is this like a, a you know, another meeting to plan to go through the list? I think that might make the best use of everybody's time Mm -hmm. um, they just set their next meeting on May 20th. Um, so either, I don't know what they have on that agenda. Um, but you could either, you know, choose another date to do a joint meeting just to focus on this. Okay. And how does everyone feel about that? Does that make sense? Well, I, I had a, a parallel suggestion. Yeah. Uh, for our, our next meeting, um, each of us could uh, bring a short list of three priorities, what we think is important. Okay. And discuss that amongst ourselves. And then we'd have a sort of a common, common position when we talk to the advisory board and to um, Nancy. Okay. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind right. of kind of fun thing, kind of fun thing to do. Right, right. So if everyone kind of comes up with three landings they feel is that are important, and then we can move forward. So that could be on the next agenda for us, and then um, and then plan a meeting with selfish advisory from there. Is that what you're you're thinking? I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, 
be more organized too that way, like presenting Selfish Advisory with what you guys think. Right. That's kind of your charge and then getting some feedback on that. Great. Um, does this require a motion? Like, is this a, a voting situation? I don't think so. No. Okay. Great. All right. Is everyone in a, in agreement there on, on choosing three landings they feel are important yeah. and we'll address it in the next meeting. Deal. Go through list. Great. Okay. And let's see, planning the next meeting. Um, I suppose we should figure out who's going to chair the next meeting. We're on rotation. Who's up next? I think, I think it's John. Is that right? No, I'm out of the I'm out of the rotation. The next next person up is Melissa. Okay. Is that is that okay with you, Melissa? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Is, how, what's our plan? Are we are we planning to rotate all the time? I think all three of you have done a good job. So why don't we just carry on that way? Okay. It shares the shares the load. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I don't mind doing that. Now I'm now I've done it. <laughs> I don't know what kind of a job I've done, but but I've given it a shot. So <laughs> we're all just figuring it out. Yeah, it's, it's on the fly. Totally great. All right, so um, anything else to add? Any more discussion for today? No, so the plan for the next meeting is gonna include uh, talking about the questions we're gonna have for the lawyer for the uh, boathouse. Yeah. And our priorities for the shellfish landings. Yeah. And approving these minutes for this meeting. Anything else? Um, um, one question I had, I, or I just was thinking of as we were thinking about prioritizing the landings is we also are interested in looking at other non shellfishing sites and John had brought that up. Yeah, he brought up pond access, right? Yeah, and I think I, as a shell fisherman, I obviously want to focus on shellfishing spots, but I think we should also think about how we want to prioritize everything too at some point mm -hmm. um, because we had talked about other sites before. I don't know if that's for the next meeting, but we should revisit. Yeah, I mean, I'm open to that as well. I mean, as as we can see, all these topics that we're looking at, they take a lot of time, um, you know, like figuring out what's going to happen with the boathouse. Who knows how long that's going to take. Um, even once we pose the legal questions, there's going to be a lot of time in between. So I suppose we may as well move forward looking at some other subjects, you know, um, you know, obviously we're looking at the Omaha situation, you know, I'm doing a little research on field point and things like that, but same thing. Those are just, that's all just going to take time. So, um, yeah, I suppose, um, we can possibly discuss, you know, some other access issues in the next meeting, whether it be pond access or, or what have you. I don't know if this was brought up, but when you guys are going through and selecting the landings that you want to prioritize, I would say you should also check out that Echeverria document that's the Appendix B and the NRAB plan. Um, because some of the landings that we have listed are very well established landings, like Powers, for example, um, or Fisherman's uh, is an agreement with the Park Service. So just looking through that document and comparing kind of which ones are vulnerable and which ones are very well established. Right. That's a good point. Thank you. George. That's a good point because there's obviously going to be landings that aren't really an issue. Maybe they're important, you know, to some of us as individuals, but they, they don't really require any attention. So, um, so that's a, that's a great point. Yes, Melissa. Um, I agree. I think that is a really good point. And it might be efficient for us to maybe do some work before the next meeting to figure out the status of each of these sites. Maybe we can split that workload so that we're yeah, ready yeah. to talk okay. about how we want to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And that might be made a little easier because when we went through the document, 
we added the number that corresponds in the report. So next to the landing, it'll be like powers number seven, and then that corresponds to number seven on that report. Okay. And you also uh, specified whether it's private, public, whether it's uh, right. uh, uh, permission has been given or not, and they're still using it. So you've given some status already in the report. Great. Yeah, they're also color coded, right, with the Echeverry report references. Great. Okay, well, um, how do you guys feel? Do you feel like we are ready to adjourn at this point? Anything else we need to wrap up? I move that we adjourn. I second. <laughs> All right, Steve? Aye. Melissa? Aye. John? John's not here, I don't think. <laughs> oh. Sonia, aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you guys for all your hard work. It's amazing. It's really appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>